by Biblical Training. The speaker is Dr. Daniel Wallace. More information is available at www.biblicaltraining.org. Today we're looking at part two of the history of the English Bible. Sadly, in the last several years, the face of Christianity has dramatically changed. And frankly, this is the only Christianity that most of you have ever known. No longer is the Bible memorized, no longer is it studied, no longer is it revered and obeyed. Today, there's an increasing marginalization of Scripture as it is being pushed out by entertainment, feel-good theology, and pragmatism. So you need to ask yourself a question. A question. What are you willing to die for? What are you willing to die for? If the Bible is not on your list, then perhaps you've become a victim of our culture. If you don't love this book, then frankly, you're only fooling yourself that you can do Christ any good because he loved this book. One of the best ways I know to stimulate our love for God's word is, in fact, to study the history of the English Bible. Yesterday, we left England with two competing Bible translations, the Bishop's Bible that was used in the churches and the Geneva Bible that was read in the homes. By far, the Geneva Bible was the more popular, and this created a problem for the clergy. They needed a translation in the churches that was also revered by the masses. So an opportunity for fixing this problem presented itself when Queen Elizabeth died in 1603 and a new monarch came on the scene. James VI of England, of uh, Scotland, had already ruled Scotland for 37 years when he became James I of England. The following January, 1604, the king summoned the religious leaders of the country to Hampton Court to air out ecclesiastical different, uh, grievances of all sorts. Not much of the conference really came to much, but for the most part, the most important uh, matter that was settled at this conference was this resolution that a translation be made of the whole Bible as consonant as can be to the original Hebrew and Greek, and this to be set out and printed without any marginal notes. The original document that authorized this new translation is kept in the manuscript room at Cambridge University. Believe it or not, I had the opportunity to see this when I was living in Cambridge on my last sabbatical in 1995, and yet I never availed myself of the opportunity. The reason, frankly, wasn't lack of interest, but rather that there were so many more important manuscripts to look at that I never found the time to get around to this one. Had I known that I would be giving this lecture to you all today, I'm sure I would have taken the opportunity to look at this great Hampton Court document. The proposal for a new translation came from a Puritan, Dr. John Reynolds. And although it did not meet with unanimous approval, it did meet with James' approval. And of course, that settled the matter. At one point, the king gushed, I could never yet see a Bible well translated in English, but I think that of all, that of Geneva is the worst. Now, why would James disapprove of the Geneva Bible so strongly? After all, this had been the official Bible in Scotland during his reign there. His animosity was most likely not due to the translation as much as to the notes. He explicitly mentioned the comment at Exodus 1.19 as problematic. Here, the Geneva margin suggested that the Hebrew midwives in Moses' day were justified in disobeying, disobeying the king's order to kill all Hebrew baby boys. And of course, a king didn't care for any disobedience of his orders. In other words, the impulse for producing the King James Bible, or at least as it is called in, the, in England, the authorized version, initially came from two groups, one religious and the other political, both of them at the top of their respective food chains. It is not altogether unfair to say that the motive to produce this grand work was more to protect the status quo than it was to meet the needs of the people. In this respect, the King James Bible resembled the Roman Catholic rhymes due version rather than its own Protestant predecessors of the 16th century. James was enthusiastic about this new project and he took a leading role in getting it off the ground. In fact, he wrote up, as far as we knew, no, the, uh, the rules for who the translator should be, so he appointed all these translators, how they should be organized, and what the principles were that they were to follow. But he did not do any of the actual translation in spite of the fact that many people, maybe even one or two of you here, think that the King James Bible means the, translated, the Bible translated by King James. He, was assigned, he assigned six panels of scholars to do the work, three for the Old Testament, two for the New Testament, 
and one for the Apocrypha. Two teams met at Oxford, two met at Cambridge, and two met at Westminster Abbey. Altogether, there were 47 men who worked on this new version. Among the rules that were supposed to be followed by the translators, two are noteworthy. First of all, although the translators were to rigorously consult the Greek and Hebrew texts, they should retain the wording of the bishop's Bible wherever possible. And second, this version must not have any marginal notes except those that explain the Greek and Hebrew words or cross-referenced other passages. But the translators did not follow these rules religiously, especially the first one. These scholars also did not consult any Greek or Hebrew manuscripts as, uh, as they did the revision. Instead, they based the work on only existing published texts. The Old Testament textual basis has not changed too dramatically since the 16th century, but the New Testament text has gone through enormous changes, and we'll discuss those things tomorrow especially. The text that the King James translators used was principally the Stephanus text of 1550, its third edition, which in turn relied essentially on Erasmus's third edition of 1522. This is the same Greek text that Tyndale had used when he did his translation. Again, we'll talk more about the Greek text behind the authorized version tomorrow when we discuss problems with the King James. The King James Version was not a brand new translation, but a revision of earlier works. Although it was supposed to be based on the Bishop's Bible, departing from it only when necessary, it really was influenced by many translations. At Oxford University, a manuscript was recently discovered that gives us a fascinating glimpse into the translation work. It's an almost behind-the-scenes document, as it were. The manuscript is a copy of the Gospels from the Bishop's Bible that was actually used by the translators through various stages of revision. And they marked this Bible up and then they handed it to the publisher or the printer and said, please print this off as the King James. You can detect the various groups that worked on this document uh, as follows. Handwritten marks note, uh, are noted on almost every verse of the text. The first team made the revision marks by hand, completing the work within a relatively short period of time, in two or three years. Then the manuscript was sent to a final revision committee, and they mark up the text still further. One of the most fascinating aspects of the work is that as the manuscript went through its stages of revision, the new version kept looking less and less like the Bishop's Bible and more and more like Tyndale. Besides Tyndale's translation, the Geneva Bible also had a huge influence on the King James, especially in the Old Testament books that Tyndale had not translated. Further, in the original preface to the King James Version, the Bible is quoted several times, and every time it is the Geneva Version that is quoted, not the King James. And perhaps most surprisingly, the rhymes Douay Version, the one that the Catholics had produced, had some impact as well. Now, the Old Testament was only completed a year or two before the King James appeared, and so it really was too late to have an influence. But the New Testament of the Catholics had already appeared in 1582, and it made its way into the authorized version in a few places. Besides using some of the language of the Catholic New Testament, especially, especially what's called Latinisms or traditional ecclesiastical terms, the King James Version also follows the textual base of the rhymes Douay. In other words, rather than following the Greek text of Erasmus, at times they followed the Latin Vulgate. They did this in nearly 100 places. In 10 places, the authorized version abandons all known Greek manuscripts for the Latin Vulgate. Nevertheless, the King James Version was still much closer to the Geneva and Tyndale than to anything else, and it may properly be regarded as the fifth revision of Tyndale. As we noted yesterday, 90% of the King James New Testament was really Tyndale's translation. Two statements made yesterday about Tyndale's influence are also worth repeating. First of all, Professor Isaac said, Tyndale's simple directness, his magical simplicity of phrase, his modest music, have given an authority to his wording that has imposed itself on all later versions. Nine-tenths of the authorized New Testament is still Tyndale, and the best is still his. Second, the introduction to a reprint of Tyndale's New Testament declares, Astonishment is still voiced that the dignitaries who prepared the 1611 authorized version for King James spoke so often with one voice, apparently miraculously. But of course they did. The voice, never acknowledged by them, was Tyndale's. At the same time, the King James translators painstakingly worked over the translation and really did produce a whole new work. On many occasions, it sacrificed Tyndale's accuracy for a more elegant rendition. 
It is obvious from a comparison of the King James New Testament with that of Tyndale that the leading principle of the King James translators was not faithfulness to the Greek original, but was elegance in English. And when it came to the Apocrypha, the King James followed its Protestant ancestors rather than the Catholic tradition by placing the Apocrypha at the end of the Old Testament. Now, it may in fact be surprising to you to realize that virtually every King James Bible included the Apocrypha for well over 200 years. This is not just a Roman Catholic phenomenon, in other words. When the authorized version first appeared in 1611, it was published with quite a few marginal notes. These notes were not just intended to explain the Hebrew or Greek word, but had diverse purposes. Over 6,500 notes appeared in the Old Testament alone, most of which give a more literal meaning of the original Hebrew. The Apocrypha added another 1,000 notes, and the New Testament had nearly 800. Altogether, there were nearly 8,500 marginal notes in the 1611 King James Version, all of which just about have dropped out since then. On a few occasions, the notes indicated textual variants. And a great number of notes explained to the reader that the translators were frankly undecided, that they essentially had to flip a coin as to the meaning of the original. Of significance here is the sensitivity that the translators had to the readers. In the preface entitled, The Translators to the Reader, they mentioned that some readers may have misgivings about the alternative renderings suggested in the margin on the ground that they may appear to shake the authority of Scripture in deciding points of controversy. But these translators had no illusions that theirs was the final word on the word. They knew that later discoveries and research would help to clear up the meaning of the original. Unfortunately, this preface is no longer printed in the King James Version. Its omission has been one of the major reasons why some religious groups believe that the King James Version is the only inspired Bible, and that the King James is perfect in every way. One commentator quipped, some people would prefer a false appearance of certainty to an honest admission of doubt. In the subsequent centuries, a great deal of research and discovery had indeed helped us to understand better the original text. Translations always need to be updated when new archaeological and manuscript discoveries are made. Now, this preface also explicitly denied that the authorized version was perfect. The actual statement here is very important to grasp. Listen to what these men had to say. To those who point out defects in the translator's works, they answer that perfection is never attainable by man. But the word of God may be recognized in the very meanest translation of the Bible. Just as the king's speech addressed to Parliament remains the king's speech when translated into other languages than that in which it was spoken, even if it be not translated word for word, and even if some of the renderings are capable of improvement. To those who complain that the translators have introduced so many changes in relation to the older English version, they answer by expressing surprise that revision and correction should be imputed as false. The whole history of Bible translation in any language is a history of repeated revision and correction. A few observations on this statement are in order. First of all, the translators explicitly deny the perfection of the King James Bible. Second, they freely admit that even the worst translation of Scripture is still to be regarded as the Word of God. Third, they make a qualitative distinction between the text written in one language and the translation of it into another. Regarding Scripture, they admit that only the original text in Greek and Hebrew was inspired. And fourth, they implicitly approve all later revisions of their own work because the very nature of Bible translation involves a history of repeated revision and correction. It's amazing today that many who are King James-only advocates would deny all four of these points. Their only excuse for doing so is that they have never read the text of the translators to the reader. But just a few years ago, that preface became available as a separate book published now by the American Bible Society. It includes both the old wording as well as an updated version, along with a full commentary. How was the King James Version originally received? It may be surprising to us today to realize that there were by no means universal applause for this translation when it rolled off the press. Some people at first, in fact, criticized this translation for being too simple too easy to understand. This was voiced especially by Roman Catholics. In anticipation of this criticism, the original preface argued that the translation 
intentionally shunned the obscurity of the papists. The pre preface went on to denounce the rhymes Douay version in these words. The Catholics have the purpose to darken the sense that although they must needs translate the Bible, yet by the language thereof, it may be kept from being understood. But we desire that the scripture may speak like itself, that it may be understood even by the very vulgar. We'll come back to this issue later when we discuss the problems of the King James Version. And although the problems are listed on the back of your outline, we're not going to discuss those until tomorrow. The new version was also criticized for its inaccuracies. The most outspoken critic was Dr. Hugh Broughton, the first-rate Hebrew scholar. Broughton, in fact, was eminently qualified to have been on the translation team. He was probably better than all of those who worked on the Old Testament, except for just one little problem. He was simply too cantankerous. As F.F. F. Bruce said, he was not cut out for collaboration with others and would have proved an impossible colleague. Probably he resented the fact that he was not invited to serve, and when the new version appeared, he sent a critique of it to one of the king's attendants. Listen to what he had to say. The late Bible was sent to me to censure, which bred in me a sadness that will grieve me while I breathe. It is so ill done. Tell his majesty that I had rather be rent in pieces with wild horses than any such translation by my consent should be urged upon poor churches. The new edition crosses me. I require it to be burnt. Now, don't you, don't you love that? Come on, Hugh, don't pull any punches. Tell us what you really think about the King James Bible. The fundament, fundamental reason that Broughton despised the King James was that it looked way too much like the Bishop's Bible and not nearly enough like the Geneva. Nevertheless, not everybody had this attitude. Although it would take 50 years for the King James to overtake the Geneva in popularity, its intrinsic worth, the rhythm, the elegance, the phrases that lingered in one's mind, in due time established the King James as the version for the church and home for public and private use, superseding the Bishop's Bible and the Geneva Bible alike. One of the ironic facts about the King James Version is that it is impossible to honestly speak about the first printing, because there never really was a first printing. The revision and correction process began immediately in 1611, even before the first printed edition was completed and put together. The pages of these two editions then, the actual first edition and the corrected second edition, seem to have been accidentally mixed in before either of them was assembled and bound. Besides these two editions, the authorized version went through at least two more in the first year alone. In the first three years, it actually went through 14 minor editions in the first three years due to the frequent mistakes in the process of translating, revising, and printing. But these are not really revisions by today's standard. Two larger overhauls, which we would call real revisions, were completed in 1629 and 1638. Within 50 years, the need was presented and an effort was made to officially re revise it once again, this time more thoroughly than the previous two revisions. But Parliament decided not to act on this impulse when Charles II ascended to the throne in 1660. The shifts of the political winds thus stymied the third revision of the King James Version. It would not undergo a major revision again for 100 years. In 1762 and 1769, the King James Version was revised for a third and fourth its final time. How many changes were made in the King James from 1611 to 1769? Nearly 100,000 changes have been made to the 1611 King James Version. The vast bulk of these are rather minor, mostly spelling and punctuation changes, but in the least, this fact shows how absolutely impossible it is today for any church or any Christian to claim, we read only the original 1611 King James Version of the Holy Bible. With all the revisions made to this translation over the centuries, printer's errors were bound to creep in. Even though the goal was to eradicate all mistakes, every printing of the King James Bible has added more. For example, in 1611, the so-called Judas Bible was printed. In Matthew 26:36, the King James Version says that Judas came with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, even though Judas had already hanged himself in the previous chapter. It was supposed to say Jesus. The very first edition of the authorized version is the basketball Bible, because it speaks of hoops instead of hooks used in the construction of the tabernacle. 
1716 edition has Jesus say in John 5:14, sin on more instead of sin no more. The next year, the famous Vinegar Bible appeared. This name was attached to the printing because the chapter title to Luke 20 said, the parable of the vinegar instead of the parable of the vineyard. And in 1792, Philip, rather than Peter, denied the Lord three times. I bet he was surprised to discover that one. Three years later, the murderer's Bible was printed. He was called this because in Mark 7:27, Jesus reportedly told the Syrophoenician woman, let the children first be killed instead of let the children first be filled. In 1807, an Oxford edition has Hebrews 9:14 say, purge your conscience from good works instead of purge your conscience from dead works. A printing of the King James Version in 1964 said that women were to adorn themselves in modern apparel, very appropriate for 1964, instead of modest apparel in 1 Timothy 2.9. But none of these printing mistakes can equal the Bibles of 1653 or 1631. These are the two evil Bibles of the King James history, for they both left out the word not at key junctures. The 1653 edition, known as the Unrighteous Bible, said, the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And the 1631 edition, the infamous wicked Bible, wrote the seventh of the Ten Commandments as thou shalt commit adultery. The Wicked Bible was such an embarrassment to the Anglican Church that the Archbishop ordered the Bibles to be burned, and he fined the printer, Robert Barker, 300 pounds, no small sum in those days. Barker, who had been the King's printer since the authorized version came out, died 14 years later in debtor's prison. Not only have there been these occasional but bizarre printing mistakes, but several errors in the 1611 edition have never been changed. For example, in both Acts 7.45, in Hebrews 4.8, the name Jesus appears when Joshua is actually meant. Hebrews 4.8 in the authorized version says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. This passage is talking about Joshua, and it's saying that although Joshua brought his people into the promised land, he could not give them the eternal rest that they needed. But by having Jesus here, the King James Version is thus saying that Jesus was inadequate that he was not able to save his people from their sins. In Greek, both Joshua and Jesus are written exactly the same way, the word Iesus. So the issue is not one of textual variation, but of inattention to the details of the interpretation of the text. Or consider Matthew 23, 24. Here the authorized version says, Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. The Greek text here means to strain out a gnat, not at a gnat. Jesus' point is the same as when he says in Luke 6:41, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? The religious leaders focused on the tiny problems of others without taking care of the big issues in their own lives. And the King James Version in Matthew 23 has permanently missed the point. Now, please understand, I'm not listing these errors to make fun of the King James Bible. But I also don't want anyone to have the illusion that it is a perfect translation. No translation is perfect. Not the King James, not the RSV, not the NIV, not the New American Standard, and not the Net Bible. In fact, just to play fair, allow me to mention an error that made its way into the second printing of the Net Bible New Testament in 1998. This translation has more notes in it than any other Bible in history. There are over half a million words of notes in the New Testament alone. And at one of them, the typist accidentally hit a second S when he wrote the conjunction as. Now, I'm not going to spell this out for you, but you can well imagine the name that this edition of the Net Bible would be called. Not only this, but as the senior New Testament editor of the Net Bible, I have to bear the brunt of responsibility here because I was the one who actually typed that word in. In spite of all the printing problems of the King James Version, it has endured the test of time. It has been called the single greatest monument to the English language. Another scholar wrote, The supremacy of the King James is one of style, not of scholarship. The men who made it did not set out to manufacture a literary classic. Classics are seldom made to order. Yet they did produce one, perhaps the only classic 
ever turned in by a committee. Leland Reichand, professor of English literature at Wheaton College, speaks of the overwhelming preference of people with literary stature in our century for the King James Bible over modern translations. The linguist Mario Pai observes, the King James Bible and Shakespeare together are responsible for well over half of all our language cliches and stock phrases. And H.L. Mencken, no friend of Christianity, declared that the King James Version was unquestionably the most beautiful book in the world. I could quote from scores of other literary authors who embrace the authorized version like no other book on the planet. What is it that makes the King James so good? In a word, it's elegance. The King James Bible has rhythm, balance, dignity, and force of style that are unparalleled in any other translation. Or again, as Professor Riken says, its touchstone is memorability. No translation today lingers in the mind like the King James of old does. Frankly, it is my conviction that every Christian should own a copy of the King James Bible. It may not be the most accurate, but it is the most elegant. And you only deny your own rich literary and religious heritage if you do not own and read a King James Bible. I think it's appropriate to close this message today by reading from 1 Corinthians 13 out of the King James Bible with just a few modern upgrades. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Thank you for listening to this lecture, brought to you by biblicaltraining.org. Feel free to make copies of this lecture to give to others, but please do not charge for these copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit our website at www.biblicaltraining.org. There you will find the finest in evangelical teaching for use in the home and the church, and it is absolutely free. Our curriculum includes classes for new believers, lay education classes, and seminary-level classes taught by some of the finest seminary teachers drawn from a wide range of evangelical traditions. Our mailing address is Post Office Box 28428, Spokane, Washington, 99228, USA.